أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I just would like to start by saying السلام عليكم to every single one of you and welcome you here on this Saturday it's Saturday right <laughs> rainy day which I know subhanallah as, as a woman you would have had a hundred excuses or reasons for not coming Easily. So we have things, we're busy, we do stuff, whatever, whether you're married or not, kids, no kids, studying, work, you probably had a lot to do, but you chose to come and attend this circle of light. I call them circles of light because just as we see the lights at night, the stars at night, you know how in a dark night you see the stars? You see the stars in the sky, right? The malaika, the angels, see the circles of knowledge from the heavens like we see the stars. So you're a shining star right now, just because, just for gathering here. And that's why, subhanAllah, halaqat al-ilm, I was just speaking to the brothers downstairs, I am not only an advocate, I think there are, if people ask me, what is the most thing that you have benefited from in your life, what has changed your life, I would say study circles, halaqat, like this. So I think they should, a woman should prioritize uh, attending them and uh, creating them as well because you can create your own study circle even if you're not a scholar i'm not a scholar myself i'm a student of knowledge you know you, you're going to be discussing the knowledge from the books it's a must because it's not only a space for knowledge and the more knowledge we have especially as women especially as women i think the ummah is revived by women of knowledge personally that's what i believe because as women you're the one who's going to be raising the next generation, whether married or not, by the way, right? You're the one who's going to impact both men and women. And the times where the ummah had, was doing really, really well, it was a time where women were very strong in their faith and their knowledge and their ilm. And the times when the women are weak in the ummah, that's when the whole ummah was weakened. You know what I'm talking about. Do you agree? A lot of the issues right now we have and struggling with and maybe recovering from you know, we're going to speak, you know, this is an a, a open discussion, but also it's a safe space and it's a private space. It's because many of us came from households that were not practicing the faith, were more practicing culture. So we saw things, we saw our parents deal with each other in a way that wasn't Islamic, but it was done in the name of Islam sometimes, right? We saw different, uh, you know, subhanAllah, marriage that wasn't the way that, like the marriage of the Rasul of Khadija. We didn't see women who were maybe empowered. We saw different roles. There was no emphasis on ilm. There was no emphasis on deen. And that's how when that happens, there's a decline. Because the um is a murabbiya. Anybody can be a mother. With all due respect, animals can mother. A mother, a cat. I've got a cat. She can have a baby. But not every mother is a mother because as Muslim mothers, and that's why we, as Muslim women, uh, Islamically, a man, whether it's your father, your husband, your brother, brother ide is supposed to, ide in an ideal society, take care of your financial needs so that you can do the terbiyah. Because terbiyah is a full-time job. And terbiyah is not going to come from what I think is right and what I think is wrong. Terbiyah comes from the knowledge I learned from the Quran and the Sunnah. Simple as that. So if I don't have time in my day or my week to learn the Quran and Sunnah, what am I teaching from? What am I, what's my source? What's my source, subhanAllah? Knowledge is key. Key in our daily lives, especially as Muslim women. You can become, you can go to university and study and learn, that's all good. But علوم Quran, learning the Quran, is actually a must even on children. Like we owe it to, one of the three rights a parent has over their child is to teach them the Quran. So how are you gonna teach your kids the Quran if you don't know the Quran yourself? It's not gonna work. You can send them off to a teacher, you can send them off to a sheikh, but teaching the Quran is not just memorization of the Quran, it's you showing them the Quran. It's you showing them what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us, inshallah. So think of knowledge, think of this halaqa of knowledge, and I really hope this inspires you to continue seeking knowledge. Don't make this like a, I come once in a while somewhere and I listen to something and then I go home. It's so crucial, sisters. We need every single one of you. Wallahi, the ummah needs every single one of you. And the ummah, need, we need to have beneficial knowledge. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to seek refuge from knowledge that is not beneficial. We need knowledge that transforms us. And when I think about knowledge, I think about a vessel. I think about, think of, it, think of knowledge as a bucket, right? Just to see some of the benefits of knowledge. There's so many benefits of knowledge. Think of knowledge as a bucket, right? We're all born with a certain size bucket, right? So we know how to eat. We know how to like, you know, have milk from our mothers or we know how to do number two. We know the basics. And then you grow bit by bit. That knowledge grows, subhanAllah. And then it grows into a certain size because you're learning to walk, you're learning to talk, you're learning, right? It grows bigger and bigger. 
Some adult buckets just remain the same size after adulthood for a long time. Because if you're not actively learning, your bucket stays the same. It's not expanding. The more you learn, the more your bucket expands. And when you think of the vessel, the bucket expands. And the more you expand, the more you'll be able to deal, the more you'll be able to make better decisions, the more you'll be able to say no to wrong, the more you'll be able to deal even with trials in life. Okay? Because think about it this way. If somebody has this size bucket and somebody has this size bucket in terms of knowledge, if a person is tested the same test, these two people, this one is tested with health or a relationship. So let's say it's a, this size ball, this test. If that size test is put in this smaller bucket, it's going to consume the person because it's small. But if that same size trial, it's the same exact same trial was put into a bigger bucket, okay, it's going to be hard, but not as much. They're not going to struggle as much as a person with smaller knowledge. They haven't expanded. Is that, is that making sense? SubhanAllah. So the more you're expanded, and you can only expand yourself with ilm, especially ulum al-Quran, especially ulum al-Din, knowing Islam. Like as women in the Quran, we're all women here. Anybody knows how many women were mentioned in the Quran? Allah spoke about us in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about three categories of people, by the way, just to give you an idea. Some verses, most verses speak to both men and women in the Quran. So Allah yukhatib both men and women. And Allah says, Ya ibadi, al uh, mu'mineen, you know, al insan. Allah actually is, the, is uh, you know, the, the narrative, the, the, the speech is to both men and women. It comes in the masculine, though. So you might think, oh, Allah is only speaking to men, but it's not the case because in Arabic, if there's a group of girls and boys, we call them by the masculine. If you study Arabic, that like, doesn't mean that we're excluding the girls. So Allah speaks to us in the Quran, either both men and women. And sometimes Allah speaks only to men in the Quran. So there's some verses only for men, and Allah only speaking to men. And there are some verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to women only. Purely just women. There are some, uh, uh, subhanAllah, uh, things just for women. And it's so interesting to see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to women only. The way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to women only is unlike any other speech in the Quran. It's full of rahmah, it's full of love, it's full of just, uh, you, you feel like Allah is, is يعني, it's just amazing when you recite those verses. How Allah speaks to women in the Quran. So, and Allah mentions women in the Quran. And nothing in the Quran is ever mentioned for the sake of, Allah mentions it like that, yeah, for, for just by accident, of course not. Billah, right? Every story of a woman mentioned, every woman mentioned in the Quran is for us to learn something from it. There's, a, there's, there's you know, for, for the woman to read and think, oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving me an example of woman. So, how many, anybody can have a guess how many women mentioned in the Quran? Maybe we should do a game. See how many women you can actually count. Let's, let's do it out loud. Yalla. Anyone? Come on, you, you know, how many women? You can call it out loud. Yes? Three? So Maryam is one. Let's, let's name them. Yalla. Maryam? Okay, to make it easier for you, because I have to make it, like it's just to be fair, <laughs> there's only one woman in the Quran mentioned by name. Everybody else references to them. Like Umm Musa, we don't know what her name is, but she's mentioned as, mentioned as Umm Musa, the mother of Musa. But we don't know what her name is. So they're mentioned indirectly. But the only one's name that is actually mentioned in the Quran is Maryam. But the 24 are mentioned by different uh, labels, different uh, Umm, you know, Zawjat, X, Y, and Z, the wife of... Okay, so we've got Maryam. Who? Sorry? The wife of Lut, yes. Uh, the uh, mother of Musa alayhi salam, yes? Yeah. Zakaria alayhi salam's wife was mentioned, yes? Asya, Asya definitely. Umrah Fir'aun, the wife of Fir'aun. Hajar, yes? Okay, there were 25. Okay, just to save time. 25 women mentioned in the Quran. And 19 of these women are amazing women. 19 of these women are really amazing, good women that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in a really good way. The six are not so good women. However, what's interesting is that each one of us, every single woman in this room, will find her personality in one of these women. And you might, yeah, that's why they were mentioned. You'll find yourself in one of those women. What's interesting about these women as well, because I'm studying them, is that I tried to find the common uh, uh, thing they had in common. What do you think that was? You know, all these women that Allah mentions in the Quran, did they have anything in common? And what was it? Anyone can guess? Love for Islam. Love for Islam. Anyone else? Related to the Sorry? Related to the prophets. Related to the prophets. Anyone else? 
Trials and tribulations, yes? Mothers. Mothers? Sorry, none of those answers are correct. <laughs> because they're not all mothers. The only thing they had in common, all these women, was that they had nothing in common. Nothing. Each one of them, so I'm going to briefly mention their name. It's really interesting. I find that stuff fascinating. Because when we talk about Muslim, when we talk about women and the ideal woman in Islam, there's usually an ideal. Like there's a, you actually can see her. <laughs> Right? Because we think all the women should look like this, should act like this, should do these things. But in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give us the ideal. Some were mothers, some were not mothers. Some were wives, some were not were wives. Some were leaders, some were not leaders. Some were different. They're all different. And that's the norm for us to all be different. And that's okay. There's space for all of us in Islam to be different. All of us. So for people to actually put that pressure, a lot of us were conditioned that you have to, a girl grows up, unfortunately, in most of our cultures and our, our homes, there's like conditioning. It's like a checklist you have to check by the time you're 25. And if you're 26, yani, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. There's a checklist. As if we're created for this checklist. Tick, 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 subhanAllah. The woman in the Quran, that's not the case. They were all different. And that, I find that so empowering. Because you want me to speak about women in the Quran, I'm not going to tell you what people said about women. I'm going to tell you what Allah says about women. That's it. So anybody can disagree, um, but you can't disagree with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Right? We can't. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words. So there has been a certain narrative about women and their space and where they should be, but I don't find it in the Quran. I'm not going to go into intentions. I'm not going to go into why. I'm not going to go back. That certain narrative that we believed without going back to the sources has been one of the reasons for our struggle as women and our family's struggle and our ummah's struggle because we are struggling because most, most people, I'm not going to say all, all families, we don't come from homes where there's strong believing women who practice the faith and they don't think about what people think. They're not there to please other people. They're not raising their children according to what, how they were raised or what, is society, what does society accept of them. They raise their children according to the Quran and Sunnah. Not many homes do that. And that's why there's struggle. Because the more distant we are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book, the more we're going to have suffering and pain. Simple as that. And the more we are, you know, we return back to the Quran, and the Quran does not need a middle person for them to translate for you what's in the Quran. Anybody can open a tafsir book and they can read for themselves. But unfortunately, we don't do that. We don't do that. One of the things that inspired me to, subhanAllah, get into tafsir and Quran, I remember a few years ago, somebody sent me a YouTube video. And it was of a Jewish woman, she's an academic, American academic, Jewish lady, Jewish, not Muslim. And she was asked to give a talk on the Quran. So this Jewish lady for her university, it was like a prestigious university, and she was asked to give a talk on the Quran. So in her uh, TEDx, I think it was a TEDx talk, she was saying, I mean, you can search her, she's, I found she inspires me to read this, to study the Quran. Jewish lady, and I'm Palestinian. <laughs> so she, in SubhanAllah, so she said in her talk, she was saying how when I was asked to talk about the Quran, I could, not just do, I could not just read some random texts about the Qur'an, I wanted to study the Qur'an. So she, she embarked on this journey of studying the Qur'an, she said, from cover to cover. So she had, she actually, in the, in the talk, she brings her, her, she shows her Qur'an, she has her mushaf, she has notes, she has tafsir, she has uh, sticky notes, she's like, for four months, she studied the Qur'an from cover to cover, verse by verse. Who's done that? Who's Muslim ever done that? I'm like, well, I felt so jealous. <laughs> I was like, here I am, I'm a da'ya. I've been giving halaqat and classes, and I've never done that. I've never actually studied the Quran from cover to cover. But it's my book, it's not her book. I was like, well, it just really made me so sad. It made me so sad. Like, this woman, not Muslim, she's doing it for purposes that are just dunya related, so that she can stand out in her presentation, and so she can say, I've studied every verse in the Quran. Which Muslim woman has done that? I did not know anybody in my circles, and I know a lot of people. I didn't do that myself. So we study certain surahs from the Quran, but this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. This is the miracle till the end of times. This is the book that's going to give us healing, that's going to give us guidance, that's going to give us light. And we are so distant from it. When somebody tells me I'm not content, I'm not happy, I'm sad, I'm not feeling well, I will always tell them, your contentment, your happiness in dunya is in relation to how the gap between you and the Quran. So if the Quran is here, and you're not right next to the Quran, and you're here or there or there or in another island, that's, you know, your measure of contentment in this dunya is in relation to the measure that you have relation with the Quran. No other way. Like, I've tried everything. Like, no, there's no, no other way. 
how close are you in, with the Quran is what's going to reflect your contentment and fulfillment and happiness in this dunya and success in the hereafter. So 25 women mentioned in the Quran. Each woman's story. So I can't tell you about all the women, but I chose seven to share with you. Okay, just to give you an idea. So I can't, I was like, I can't, we don't have enough time to speak about all the 25. But I want to share with you seven women that you will find hopefully yourself in one of them and that you can learn from one of them inshallah and it'll be interesting how i just want you to think about them in, a, in, in the way that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about them the first woman ever mentioned in the quran who was she anyone knows ever yes hawa definitely in surah al-baqarah you know just in the third page allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the story of adam and hawa our mother eve in the quran what stands out about the story of hawa anybody knows What's special about the mention of Hawa? She was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the rib of uh, the Adam. The way she was created. What else? <laughs> We're talking about personality wise. We're talking about characteristics. Yes? She was a woman of Jannah. Excellent. Because I'm just going to you, uh, come to that point soon. This is somebody, you know how like uh, when I migrated from Australia to Istanbul, we did Hijra, right? It was dunya, earth to earth. Imagine, and that was painful. <laughs> that was very, very painful. It was a choice, but it was very painful. Imagine somebody doing hijrah from Jannah. She had, go, she had to go back to earth. Can you, I don't think we can imagine that because we don't even know what that's like. She went from Jannah where everything is done for her, where everything is easy. Jannah, Jannah, she lived in Jannah where she wished something and it was in her hands. And she lived in Jannah for many, many years. And then how painful must have been for Hawa to go from Jannah to earth? Just, we never thought about that pain <laughs> that Hawa went through. Yes, Sid? I think you mentioned that a few months ago, I was thinking about the Hawa, I was thinking about the Adam of Islam. I came across a context where they were, the Jibreel al-Islam, I came across a book that the Jibreel al-Islam taught him how to live on this earth. Hard, hard, yes, it's hard. Yes, yes, but this is where our parents came from. And that's why, subhanAllah, one of the reasons we struggle in dunya is because we're yearning for the Jannah living that our mother lived in. That's where we came from. When people tell you, go back to where you came from, you came from Jannah. Wallahi. And you, I want to go back to where I came. Inshallah, Ya Rab. Ya Rab, all of us go back to where. Because this dunya is, subhanAllah. So that's why we're trying. We, it, it, it's our parents, our fathers. Our father, our mother, Adam and Hawa, are the fathers and mothers of humanity. They came from Jannah. We all came from one couple. We All of us, you know, came from the entire people, you know, human population, subhanAllah. And they came from Jannah. They came from Jannah. So when you, what, why we struggle in this dunya is because we're yearning for this Jannah feeling. And we're trying to find it here, but it doesn't work. Because we want permanent, permanent love. We want permanent, uh, we don't want any fear. We don't want the idea of loss. We don't want, and these are all Jannah feelings. They're Jannah feelings that we're yearning for. And the more you're trying to make dunya Jannah, the more you're going to struggle and suffer, subhanAllah. The first thing that stands out of, uh, you know, in the story, because we're talking about her story. We're talking about stories. And I want you to find your story in one of these women. Or maybe all of them, maybe one of them. Uh, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, as I mentioned, did not mention these women for the sake of just mentioning them. So it's fun. It's story time. Three quarters of the Quran are stories. And unfortunately, the way we even teach our kids the stories, you know, Yusuf's brothers, they, they um, you know, dropped him at the well and they left. And good night. It's a good night. A beautiful bedtime story. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the story, not because for the sake of the story. For you and for me to see what did that person do in the story? How did they react to the test? How did they react to when a person told them when this happened? Their reaction. So we need to learn from the reaction, not the story. That's why the story is for. You need to learn from people's mistakes or people's actions. Allah is showing us in the Quran this. Don't just be invested in the story. It's such an interesting story. What color hair did he have? People do that, you know, this descriptions of the, no. Focus on the moral of the story. Focus on the point of the story. So very briefly, in the story of Sitna Hawa, Eve alayhi salam, her story is about agency. You might be thinking, how is her story about agency? It's about responsibility. It's about choice. The first mention of a woman in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, unlike the Christian traditions where they blame the woman, that she's the one who whispered in the ear of Adam to eat from the apple, we don't have that in the Quran. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran speaks about how both of them were responsible. Both decided. Allah speaks about, you know, فَأَكَلَا مِنْهَا They both ate from the tree. It wasn't somebody's, يعني, uh, it wasn't just Adam's fault or Eve's fault. Both of them, both of them, both of them. And then Allah says, I sent them both down to, her, to earth because they did this sin, both of them. So what does that tell us? I can't say, I, 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 it's my husband. Can't. You're responsible, 100% as man. Because she was part of doing the sin as Adam did. And Allah did not excuse her by herself. They both decided and they did and they took action. So you have agency. You have responsibility. You are a human on your own, 100%, despite of your marital status, despite of what's going on. If you see wrong, you have to change it. You have to not accept wrong. You can't say, it's not my fault. It's, it's not in my hands. I never, ever act like you're helpless because you are not. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you power and gave you tools in our deen. And Allah created both man and woman are equals. That's what Allah says in the Quran. We are all both muhasabeen. You're not gonna, yani you can't pray four times a day and your husband prays five times a day and it's fine. We're equal in ibadat, we're equal in almost everything, subhanAllah. Of course, we have different roles, but this is very, very important that it was, she was responsible for eating from the apple just like Adam. She can't meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on judgment day and say, well, Adam made me do it. Can she say that? Like, this is a sin. Why did you eat from the apple? I told you not to eat from the apple. You listened to the whispers of the shaitan. And by the way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he created them in Jannah, he told them not to eat. They, it wasn't like they ate straight away. In the narrations, in the, in the Islamic traditions, it says that after many hundreds of years, it wasn't like straight after. It was like hundreds of years. And then they were like looking at the tree. And they're like, why this tree? Why this particular tree out of all the countless trees in Jannah? Sometimes out of the countless halal that Allah has given you in dunya, you might desire that one thing that is not good for you, as a woman as well. And it might be your test, and it might take you out of Jannah. So you need to be careful. That's the story of man. That's the first story of a woman. Listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands so that you're not taking out of Jannah, actually out of Jannah. And you are responsible. You cannot blame anybody but yourself. How empowering is that? That's the first story. The second story I chose, like it's not the second in terms of order, I want to speak about Maryam, alayhi salam. You all know Maryam. There's a verse, in, there's an entire chapter in the Quran. Any Maryams here in the room? Just my Maryam. I've got a Maryam. <laughs> She's just like, oh, mom, no. <laughs> so, Maryam, subhanAllah. So, Maryam, alayhi salam, uh, a very powerful story. All of them are powerful stories, by the way. What stands out in the story of Maryam, sisters? Anybody knows? Because these are women. This, you know, we should know the women in the Quran, yes? Yes, so that's her story. But what's her personality? Yes? Yes, so the name Maryam actually means, the actual literal Arabic meaning, the, the name Maryam means, even in, in English, Mary, it means Al-Abida, the worshipper. That's what, it's a beautiful name. Thank you, you're welcome, Maryam. So it means, <laughs> so it means Al-Abida, the one who worshiped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Maryam, alayhi salam, all she did in her life was to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She had a mihrab, a mihrab. So this is a woman who, by the way, perfected her faith. There's only four women that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us have perfect faith. Perfect faith. Yeah. Maryam is one of them. Like, I don't even know what perfect faith looks like, but can you imagine somebody having perfect faith? Maryam was one of them, was one of the four. Who are the other three? Asya, Asya Khadija, and Fatima, radiallahu anha. So Maryam was one of the first women to ever perfect faith, right? So what stands, there's so many things we can talk about Maryam's story, but I want to talk about one aspect that relates to all of us. And this is how I want you sisters, inshallah, and hopefully inspire you to start reciting the Quran this way. So that you are reading the Quran according to your own story. You're finding yourself in the Quran. You're reading with tadabbur, with understanding, with reflection. You're not just reciting for the sake of, yeah, alhamdulillah, I've done three pages today. There's no point reading this way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he has sent this Quran down, so that you do tadabbur of the ayat. You do deep contemplation. And deep contemplation, the best definition of deep contemplation is to display each ayah on your heart. If you start reciting this way, your life will change. You will never get enough of the Quran. It won't feel like another chore I have to do today. I haven't read Quran. I haven't done my word. I haven't done, no, it won't feel like this. You will be doing it because you just can't wait to hear how, what Allah is telling you. It just changes, subhanAllah, everything. So in the story of uh, Maryam, alayhi salam, as the sister mentioned, Jazakallah uh, khairan, so Maryam was this abida, this chaste woman, and suddenly she was tested. I think the test of chastity is the most difficult test any woman could be tested with, I personally believe. For somebody to say that you 
have given birth or you got pregnant out of zina or out of woodlock, like that's the worst. I'm not sure about you, but I, I don't think there's anything worse than a woman being tested with her, with her, with her ird, with her own, correct? Like for someone to say, you, you gave birth in haram. Like that is the worst, worst of trials. So that's, this Abida woman suddenly has a baby. Can you believe? Like she was a high, of high status in her ibadah. She was always in her mihrab, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And suddenly she has a baby. Can you imagine the, 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 the shame, the, the, the fear, the just, subhanAllah, huge test that uh, uh, Maryam alayhi salam had to go through. Maryam alayhi salam, in that time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent her the angel Jibreel and she got pregnant, she gave birth. You know what she said when she gave birth? It's a test, it's a miracle. In the Quran it's mentioned. She says, this abida, this woman with the most faith, she said, Ya laytani mittu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasiyan mansiyya. You know what she says? She wishes she had died. It's mentioned in the Quran. For her story is a reminder for me and for you that sometimes you might be going through so many difficulties, things can be so hard, you might be tested so much that you wish you die. And that's okay. And Allah mentioned that in the Quran. She wasn't just sad. She, you know, we go through sadness, right? Sad times, difficult times. She was so sad. You know, some of you may have lived that experience. I lived it when I was very sick in the ICU for three months. I just wished, I was like, Ya Rabb, just if I'm going to stay like this, please take me, Ya Allah. You, know, you can actually make that dua. If this dunya is not good for me, take me, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So for you to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take your, you, know, you wish death, of course it means that you are at your lowest of low. Like there's no, the lowest. You can't, you just don't want to be alive anymore. So she said, this faithful woman, this woman who had the most perfect faith, not the most, the perfect faith, Iman, she had Iman, and she wished to die? Yes. So I can be sad and I can be religious? Yes. I can feel down, I can feel sad. It's a, this is validation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you can feel. Can you see sisters how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to us? Like, this is a woman with complete faith, because sometimes now when we're sad or we're feeling down, they tell us you don't have Iman. You have to go check your Iman. You need to recite more Quran. You need to pray more. You're not a good Muslim. They blame it on your faith. And this is unacceptable to do. Hello, of course, Iman and reading the Quran, it helps. But sometimes you go through the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the khayr, khayr al-bashar, the best of creation. When Khadija died, radiallahu anha, and his uncle, who was like his father, he, he kind of lost a father figure and Khadija, his wife for 25 years, his best friend, his companion, the one who believed in him. The Rasul wasn't sad for a day or two or three. And he's the Rasulullah. Like he, he saw Jannah and Nar. And he was sad for an entire year. Entire year, and <laughs> he's Rasulullah. So this, it was called Aam al huzun the year of sadness. We tend to kind of, you know, we are usually, our emotions are used against us. You're weak. Why are you still sad? The Rasul had a year of sadness. <laughs> Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was a prophet. It is normal to exercise your feelings. It is normal to express your feelings. It's normal to feel sad. Like it's normal to feel happy. When we sit and laugh about a joke, nobody tells you stop laughing. But when you sit and cry, people are like, why are you crying? Or when you're crying, you have to apologize. Oh, sorry, I'm crying. Like, why are you apologizing for crying? Do we apologize when we laugh? Sorry, I'm laughing. Sorry, guys, just laughing. As if these emotions are okay, and these emotions are not okay. To be human is to feel it all and to live all emotions. To feel sad, to feel happy, to feel joyful, to feel depressed, to feel anxious. To feel, as long as it's within the healthy measure, so that it's not affecting our ibadah. The Rasul was sad, but he didn't stop reciting Quran or praying. Right? So there's a difference because some people now, I'm so sad, I don't want to do anything. No, you're going to plummet. You're going to go down this way. No, the, you can go to a level of sadness, yes, but not below, not, not to lose your faith because nothing is worth it. So Maryam alayhi salam wished she had died and she, this is a woman who had complete faith. So it's okay for us to feel sad. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling you it's okay to be sad. And you know what Allah, you know the formula for sadness for women is, uh, is mentioned in the story of Maryam. Anybody knows the formula for, what do you do when you're sad? Allah tells us what to do when we are sad. When we are so sad like Maryam, he told her what to do. Anyone knows what's the formula? Like how do you do sadness when I'm sad? What do I do? I'm so sad, I'm going through a hard time, I'm going through a hardship, I'm being tested with my health, I, I've lost a loved one, I'm being tested with my marriage, I'm being tested with a child, I'm being tested that I can't find a husband yet, I'm not married, I'm being tested with a, with a sin. Whatever it is, you know what the, what the form, there's a formula for sadness. If you recite the Quran, you'll be able to see the formula. Allah subhanahu how do you guys do sadness? Normally cries. <laughs> but it's better to go and sujood than cry that makes you feel. If you can go and sujood. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not ask Maryam to do ibadah when she was sad. Allah, we're talking about what Allah is saying. <laughs> Again. So people tell you, like, when you're sad, go to something more Quran. When you're sad, sometimes you just can't, you, you can only do the basics. True? So there's no expectations from Allah, the Creator. You know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told her when she said that? She said, Ya laytani, in the Quran, Surah Maryam, Ya laytani mittu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasir man siya. I wish I had died. Instantly, instantly, fanadaha min tahtiha, and from beneath her, he called her, you know, the ulama, tafsir ulama say, it's either Isa alayhi salam as a baby, or the angels, of course, through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's revelation, he called her out and he told her what to do. La tahzani, number one, do not be sad. Allah made beneath you a, a precious thing. So your very own trial is the most precious thing that you need. So a reminder that if it's not in my control, if I'm being tested with a test, it might not be the most happiest times in my life, but it is what's going to make me. Because it's going to make me stronger. Because we only grow and we become stronger through our tests, not through the good times. Nobody grows from good times. No one grows from good times. And as a human being, if you want to experience the full human experience, if Allah, that's why Allah says in the hadith, the Rasul tells us, إذا أحب الله عبدا ابتلاه. If Allah loves a slave, Allah will test them. That doesn't make sense. If he loves me, he's going to test me. <laughs> yeah, because it, it allows you to expand. We expand not just through knowledge, but through tests, if you are patient. So yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he loves you, he will test you. It doesn't make sense. If he loves me, he's going to give me trials. I'm going to have to lose loved ones. I'm going to have to suffer. I'm going to have to be sad. Yeah. If you took the lesson, Allah will test you, and then if you don't, if you don't learn, subhanAllah. So Allah, and, and the, in the hadith, the hadith says, and أَشَدُّ النَّاسِ ابْتِلَاءً are who? The Anbiya. And the Anbiya are the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prophets, and then the one who are more righteous, and so on and so forth. So what's the formula for sadness? This is for you all to do sadness from the Quran, so nobody can, you can give them the evidence, and it's in the Quran. Number one, don't be sad. It's a mindset. لا تحزني, uh, and to know that this is khair for you even if you don't see how it's khair now, because our knowledge is so limited to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. You don't know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. You don't know what's khair for you. And in, in this example, I like to give uh, يعني, the metaphor of, if you were given on the first day of your existence in this dunya, as a baby, somebody gives you, imagine, imagine this is, happens, يعني. somebody gives you a book, okay? Somebody gives you a book, empty book, and they tell you, Khudi, sit down, you have an hour to write your life. Write whatever you want. From the day you're born till the day you die. Even write how you're going to die. Even write what's going to happen. Who are you going to get married to? How much money are you going to have? Where are you going to live? Write it all. Okay? You, imagine if we all got that. Imagine if we all got the chance to write our lives in a book. From the day we're born till we die. And then, okay, that's one option. That's option A. Or would you choose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's writing of your book? <laughs> Which one would you choose? But that book that Allah writes for you, it's mysterious. Like... You don't know, some things are not going to be nice. Some things you're going to be have trials. You're not going to know when you're going to die, how you're going to die, what's going to happen. Which book would you choose? The book you have written yourself. You have written yourself or Allah's book for you. The wise one would choose Allah's book for them. The wise one. Why? Wouldn't you want the predictable? Wouldn't you want the, yani, khalas? No. You're not smart to do that, subhanAllah. So, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. So, la tahzani. It's khair for you. And then Allah tells her something very interesting to do. فَكُلِي وَشْرَبِي وَقَرِّي عَيْنَا This is the sadness formula for Maryam. Eat and drink and do whatever makes you comfortable. When was the last time? <laughs> Honestly, sisters, if you put your hand up, if you were, you've been sad in a time in your life and anybody in your family or loved ones told you, eat, drink, and do whatever makes you relax. You had somebody tell you that? Mashallah. Ah, oh, mashallah. Yusuf is a precious. Subhanallah. This is Quranic. He's a good boy. May Allah bless him, Ya Rabbi. May Allah you know, protect him for you. Yeah, subhanallah. Mashallah. So eat. Allah's telling her. In this time that you're so sad, he didn't tell her, go back to the mihrab, your mihrab, and continue praying. Stay in sujood. Of course, she was doing the basics, but that wasn't asked of her. He, uh, he, Allah tells her, kuli, eat. And drink, drink, and qarri'ayna. Qarri'ayna, basically, there's no English equivalent of qarri'ayna. What it means is, do anything that gives you the coolness of your ayn, eye. So if it means that you just want to sleep, you can sleep. If it means that you just want to hang out with people, you can. If it means that you just want to sit and watch documentaries on Netflix, you can. If it means you just want to do what? You want to bake? Bake. If, as long as it's halal, do it. Do whatever helps you heal. 
<laughs> Sorry, sister. The food that, that came to her was healthy food. Yes, yes, so wholesome food. Easy to go to, like, food that isn't good for us. Absolutely. Food that is going to be damaging to us. So Makes it worse. Yes, she had dates, she had water, of course, subhanAllah. But the idea was to just eat and enjoy yourself. I think with Maria, like, the food is already from the beginning. <laughs> she used to get Jannah food, too. But, but on that note, we're going to come to that, subhanAllah. Well, Allah also tells her, that's a th part of the sadness formula, Okay, so eat, drink, and do the coolness of your eye, do whatever makes you feel happy. But you know what Allah asked her to do as well? And she's just given birth. She's just given birth by the palm tree. Allah is telling her to shake the palm tree so that dates can come down. I'm not sure if you've seen palm trees, but you cannot shake a palm tree. This is not how you get dates. And I sometimes, subhanAllah, I, I posted that, that verse, and like, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just did this miracle. She gave birth to a son without marriage. Can't Allah yeah, and just give her the dates? Like, can't she just have the dates on a plate sitting there? No. Shake the tree. Huzzi. Shake. Take action, even if it's little. Even if you think it's not going to, the action she was going to take is not going to actually create a difference. But she still needs to take the first step. She still needs to take initiative. So when you're sad, do something little. I remember, subhanAllah, I had a client once who was very depressed. Of course, you know, when somebody's clinically depressed, it's different from sadness. Clinical depression, you need to see a therapist and you need help. Sometimes there are uh, hormonal imbalances. So all this talk would not apply to a person who has clinical depression, that they need sometimes medications or they need support. And there's no shame in that. It's like somebody who has cancer like any, or, or diabetes. We can't tell them just eat, drink, and uh, do whatever you like. Yeah, you do that, alhamdulillah, but you also have to see, seek you know, medicine, medical help, or a naturopath, or whatever. Just seek the helpers. Subhanallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told her to, to, to shake the tree. So, that, so this lady, this client I had, she was very depressed. She was very sad, very low. She would not leave bed. She would not get out of bed. So the, I was like, what can you do? She's like, I can't get out of bed. I just can't get out of bed. She was seeing a therapist, alhamdulillah, but she was severely depressed. And I said, okay, we're going to do one task a day, just one thing a day. What is one thing you can do? She said, I was like, I need you to do one thing. Even, and she was like, okay, give me an idea. And I said, okay, um, just go out to your front uh, you know, yard and just get the mail from the mailbox. Can you do that? She's like, oh, I'm not sure I can do that. I can't walk out my door, subhanAllah. I was like, just, let's just that thing for the whole day. And she did that. She took action. Huzzi. She shook the tree, subhanAllah. So she took, she was like, you know, the first day it was hard. Second day it was easier. Even, you might think it's a mundane task. It's a stupid task. What do you mean get the mail from the one side? But when a person is going through sadness, what do you mean shake the tree? How is that going to make me feel better? <laughs> just take one little action, whatever that is. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see that you're pursuing, that you're trying the best that you can, subhanAllah. Huzzi ilayki. Take, take action. And then the last formula, the last uh, step from the formula. So we said eat, drink, do whatever you like, take action even if it's small. The last one is quite interesting. You know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells her? And if you see somebody, فَقُولِي say, إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ صَوْمًا فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ إِنْسِيَّ I have fasted from speaking and I don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> oh, that's mentioned in the Qur'an? Yes, it is. Because when you're very sad, you just need time out. You need to disconnect. Get off social media. Don't see people. Like, I'm not telling you to become antisocial, but sometimes distance is so good for your soul. Allah is telling her, don't explain yourself. Don't even justify what you're doing. Just don't talk to anybody. Subhanallah, this is, the, this is how Allah is speaking to a woman who is very sad, who has wished that she had died. This is what Allah tells her to do. So don't even explain yourself because you, when you're so sad, you have no energy. Sometimes to go and explain and tell people things. Just say, I'm taking time off work, time off whatever. I'm gonna take, I just want to disconnect off social media. I need to rest. I need to because minimize social interactions. Give yourself that time to heal. Solitude. Something women, hello, women, I'm not sure about you ladies here in the UK, in Australia, I think you know, we have the statistics. One out of two Australian women have anxiety. One out of two. So it's the, the illness of the, the times that we are living in. And is it because that we are weak? I don't think that we are weak. We are strong, like our grandmothers used to be strong. We have generations of mothers that were okay and they coped. Why is it that in our times we are breaking? Breaking. Not because we are weak, but because the environments we are living in are so toxic. We have no, like, the, 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 the systems are not supporting us. You know, you have to do everything on your own. I'm not sure about you ladies, but in Australia, and I'm assuming here it's similar, you're just, you know, homework for the kids, picking up, dropping off. You have to look after your health. You have to keep your house clean. You have to do the grocery shopping. You have to do terbiya. You have to look nice for your husband. You have to have social life. You have to study. You have to learn. You have to do...
too many things, too many expectations. So that breaks any human being because the, the weight is too much. We expect so much from women, subhanAllah. And Allah subhanAllah doesn't expect that from us. So we're not weak. It's just because the times we are living in make us, you know, this way. But again, we need to step up and take it, you know, you know we need to take accountability and do the best that we can to, give, to get strength. And where is the strength from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We need the tools. We need the divine tools. So this is uh, Maryam alayhi salam. So Hawa was about agency and taking responsibility. Maryam alayhi salam had to do sadness. And it's okay to feel your feelings. And it's okay to be a pious person and be sad. So give, Allah is telling us to, be, to do that. The third woman I want to speak about is Umm Musa, the mother of Musa. Umm Musa in the Quran, so there's Ukht Musa also mentioned in the Quran, his sister, which is an amazing story as well. But the mother of Musa is quite interesting. This is a woman who, as you all know, at, at her times, Fir'aun saw in a dream that one day from the Bani Israel, from the children of Israel, his throne is going to be dismantled. Somebody's going to come and take over. And, you know, we're talking about Fir'aun here. Fir'aun is, is somebody who's Fir'aun. Like Fir'aun, there's never, the earth has never witnessed or had somebody as bad as Fir'aun. Right? So it was one year he would kill all the babies. This is a baby killer. And one year he wouldn't kill the babies. So the year that Umm Musa gave birth to Musa, it was the time that all babies have to be killed in Bani Israel. You know, how, like, how evil... <laughs> <laughs> like there's evil and there's frown. <laughs> because if a person kills babies, that's next, that's, we can't comprehend that. Like you can't kill a baby. Like no normal human being does that. Anyway, that's what he did. You guys are going? Yeah, like, okay, inshallah. Have fun. Assalamu alaikum. So subhanAllah, uh, 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 Umm Musa. So she gave birth. And uh, for the, who, who, who's a mother here? Mothers, put your hand up. Yes. So I'm going to talk about some feelings that will relate to you, Ernie, because you have to be a mother to understand this. So she's just given birth to this beautiful baby boy, and now she's so scared that Bani Israel, the army, they're coming, they know, they're here in the community who's given birth, and they come and they kill the baby in front of their eyes. They, they kill the baby, they stab the baby, they kill the baby. Billah. So she was so scared that they're going to come and take her baby, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired her to throw him in the Nile, to throw him in the sea. The ulama say it's interesting how you know, she is, and then, of course, yeah, you can't, this is just Umm Musa, she was inspired. No one <laughs> gets inspirations like that. So this is a special, it's a miracle, subhanAllah. So Umm Musa, Allah, she, was, she loved Musa so much, and then she puts him in a basket, and then she throws him into the Nile River. And she asks her sister to look where he's going and whatnot. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know how he describes her heart? Allah talks about her heart in the Quran. Allah is speaking about a woman's heart? Yes. Allah says, after she's done that, after she did that, because, you know, it, it was yani, uh, the most probably scariest thing in her life. فَأَصْبَحَ فُؤَادُ أُمِّ مُوسَى فَارِغَةً And uh, the, the translation of this, the heart of Musa, of Umm Musa, the mother of Musa, became empty. Empty. I have a friend, one of my childhood friends, she lost her son. He drowned in the, in the sea. He was eight years old. And subhanAllah, when she and a few other sisters who've lost their children, and when you ask them about how they're feeling, they tell you, my heart is empty. I'm empty. Empty. There's, whole, like, there's space inside. They can't even describe, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our children. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easier for the sisters who are tested with loss of their children. It's, it's one of the hardest tests ever. So she lost her child. She thought, khalas, I lost my child. Well, Allah says, and her heart became empty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, speaking about the heart, describing the heart of a woman, Yes. And then the, the story continues. Of course, she had faith in Allah and she surrendered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the story continues where Allah says, and then he returned, it, he returned Musa to her. Why? You know why Allah returned, it, returned him to her? لِكَيْ لَا تَحْزَن So that she's not sad. And Allah never, there's a few verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically speaks about how Allah does not want, want women to be sad. It's not mentioned with men. <laughs> Only mentioned when Allah speaks about two women. I don't want you to be sad. لِكَيْ وَرَدَدْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ أُمِّهِ كَيْ تَقَرَّ عَيْنُهَا So her eye is cool and she's not crying anymore. وَلَا تَحْزَن And so she's not sad. So Allah cares about your heart? Yes, He does. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us everything in the Qur'an for us to have strong hearts and for us not to break our hearts. Because Allah cares about you. This is, these verses, when you recite them, the emotive language, it's like a hug from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like Allah's embrace to women. But we're not reciting the Qur'an this way so that we can understand. So this is a story of Umm Musa. That loss is not easy. And um, if you have lost a child or if you've lost a loved one, 
You know the solution for her healing? What was the solution for her healing? Anyone knows? When, when, you're, like, when something catastrophic happens, like you lose your child, which is something out of your control, or you've lost a relationship, or you've lost your health, or something major happens in life. You know what the solution is? What's the solution? Allah tells us in the Quran. Allah tells us how she healed. You know how she healed? فَرَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قَلْبِهَا We've just tied her heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sealed her heart. So when somebody is going through a trial, one of the best du'as to make, Ya Rab, seal my heart. Because nothing else makes sense. Sometimes all the means in dunya, you can hear a, a thousand khutbas, you can have a thousand people helping you, nothing will help. You know, Iman, my friend, the one who lost her, her son, eight years old, she said nothing, nothing. Like, mashallah, when she heard the news about him uh, dying, the first reaction was, and it was her favorite child, it was her youngest child. She would go everywhere with him because she loved, like he was the youngest, he was the cutest, and he, she was very attached to him out of all her kids, subhanAllah. And Allah took away from her, her son, the one she's most closest to. The first thing she did when she heard the news, she went, she went made wudu and went to sujood. MashaAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sealed her heart. And afterwards I was like, how do you do that? Like, do you prepare for that? She's like, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sealed my heart because otherwise I would have lost it. I would have gone crazy because nothing else makes sense. Like nothing. No one, her mom was there, her dad was there, her brothers, her, no one could say anything that would make her feel better. No one could offer you anything in those times that would make you feel okay. No one. Feel some tests in life where no one. You only, so Allah, alhamdulillah, Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if Allah does not seal your heart, you're lost. So we need to surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surrender, ultimate surrender for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Ya Rab, hold me through this. Ya Rab, carry me through this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carried Umm Musa through this time, through this loss. وَرَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قَلْبِهَا Allah says, وَرَبَطْنَا It's tied, we tied, we sealed عَلَىٰ قَلْبِهَا We sealed her heart. Otherwise, she could have just lost it. Subhanallah. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to seal your heart if you're going through a difficulty because you need him. He is the source of strength. And all the power and strength on earth, if Allah doesn't want you to, they're not going to benefit you. They're not going to benefit you, they're not going to help you. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you need in those times. Um, number six, we have two more. I thought I'll speak to you about the story of Bilqis. Who knows who is Bilqis? Yes? She's a queen. Queen Bilqis. So she's a queen mentioned in the Quran and she was a leader of a, a, a big, big tribe in Yemen. And she was a leader. She was leading both men and women. Yes, she's mentioned in the Quran. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so when people talk about woman leadership, yes, you can be a leader. You can be anything that you want. It's mentioned in the Quran. Bilqis was a leader as long as you have your, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're fulfilling your Islamic duties and, you know, what your roles are and your hijab, you can do whatever you want to do. Subhanallah. So Bilqis, again, the story of Bilqis is quite interesting because usually you think that intelligence and, and mind, like usually that's what we've been taught, that men have more mind and you have less minds. You're more emotional. That's why you can't lead. That's why you can't be in places where, because you're emotional. You're just emotional woman. The story of Bilqis shows how she had a tribe of men. She had a shura of men. So when, when she heard about Sulaiman and he asked them to come and become Muslims, everybody was like, who is this Sulaiman? Her tribe, the men. were like, you know, who is this Sulaiman? We are strong men. We have power. We have army. We can defeat him. So they were acting out of their egos. So their minds. You know, uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, logically speaking, we can defeat him. We are very strong. We are the people of Yemen. We can go to war with him. What did she say? She used her emotive power, EQ, which is so as important as the mind. She said, no, you know, I've heard in the Quran, it's mentioned two pages about Balqis in the Quran. She said, no, I know so many people who went into war and the, 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 the you know, Azza became the Adilla. The people who are honored in the tribe would become the lowest in the tribe. Families would get, people would die. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go and talk to him and see what he wants. That's ultimate wisdom, ultimate mind, ultimate emotional intelligence. It's not, by the way, there's EQ, emotional, and there's IQ. IQ, the mind, EQ, emotional intelligence. And it's actually, in research, it shows that people who, with higher EQ do better in life than people with higher IQ. You know what I'm talking about. So somebody who's just really good at maths and science, it doesn't mean that they're going to be successful in relationships, in dealings with their children, in work, in haya, in life, in communicating, in their own feelings. But a person with a high EQ does that. So you have a power, and Allah subhanahu wa has given us this power, you know why? By, by nature, Allah create, by design, Allah created us with this higher power. 
And it's not something against us. It has been used against us. Oh, you're emotional. Oh, you're getting your period. You're crying. <laughs> this, 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 the way Allah created us with this high EQ, emotional intelligence, is because we have a rahim. We have a womb. You're created with an organ the man doesn't have. So by nature, you're a mother, even if you never have children. I believe that. Sitna Aisha mothered all the Sahaba. She never had children. And she's called Umm al Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers. But she's never had her own kids. So just by the fact that you're a woman and you have a womb, you are a merciful person. You are the glue in your community. You are the glue in your family. You're the one, I believe that women have powers more than men by yani, a lot. Because I have seen in families, a woman can break or make a family. I believe that. Men are more like direct, more simple in certain ways. And again, everybody has a responsibility and a duty. But I do believe that if a woman actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about kaid nisa the power of women. Allah talks about it. Subhanallah, kaid nisa When Yusuf, one of the women also, Imra'at al-Aziz, she sent Yusuf to jail because of her emotional power over her husband, over you know what she's done and the scene she has done, subhanallah. So women can do things. They've got power, subhanallah. So this power has to be used for good, inshallah. So this is Bilqis' story. Leadership in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and practice, you know, it's, she's an example of wisdom, she's an example of intelligence, she's an example of a woman who used her emotional intelligence in a way to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and save her people. Not only in dunya, they would have, if, if Suleiman came with his army of not only humans, he had an army of jinn and everything was under his control, that was his power, right? Suleiman had the, every, like the asafir, the, the hudhud, the, the jinn, everything was in the creation under his control. Not just the humans, that was the army. Imagine that kind of army coming into this, this city, subhanAllah. So uh, she saved them in this dunya, and she also saved them in the hereafter. Because they, well, you know what happened? She became Muslim, they all became Muslim. They go to Jannah, inshallah. So she saved them in both dunya and akhir. And finally, the last one we're going to speak about, we're going to open up for Q&A, inshallah, is uh, the story of, anybody knows Khawla bint Thalaba in the Quran? Yes, Khawla bint Thalaba. Very, all these women are important women that we need to know, sisters, subhanAllah. Because we need to learn from their stories. There's an entire chapter in the Quran called Al-Mujadila. You know what the Mujadila means? This is the, the surah's name. Like we have the Baqarah, the cow, we have Al-Mujadila. This is a verse in the Quran. Al-Mujadila means the woman who argues. <laughs> we have an entire surah that's called this. Is this something good? Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about it in a good way that this is actually a good attribute to have. If you are doing jidal, if you're doing argument with haqq, with justice, yes, talk, speak up, never see wrong and be quiet about it. It's not from the attributes of a believer to see zulm and wrong and be quiet because I don't want to rock the boat. Never compromise on your faith. Never compromise on justice. Never, ever, ever, because you're going to pay the price. Never compromise if your husband hits you physically. I was listening to a sheikh yesterday. He was talking about this. It was in a lecture. Uh, it was an Arabic sheikh, and he was talking, he, he was, it was both mixed woman, uh, men and women. And he was saying, uh, if your husband hits you, call the police for him. And everybody was, was like, oh, you know, like they weren't happy. But that not that normal, that if somebody abuses you, physically harms you, that you need to protect yourself? It's actually, never allow it, never allow it. It's not in Islam, nobody's allowed to harm you. No one is allowed to harm you, no matter who they are. No matter who they are. It, does, it doesn't just because they're your husband or your father or your whatever, no one is allowed to harm you physically. No one. This is a haqq by creation, by default, that Allah created you. This is, so, uh, and everybody was like, uh, as if it's something strange that he was sharing. Everybody was like, uh, you know, like, uh, we don't like that. But it's okay for a person to harm somebody else physically, but it's not okay for that person to be held accountable. What happened to us? <laughs> what is the justice? That's okay. We have to be shush, shush about that. And then, you know, but when it's the other way, when you have to seek justice, no, 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 you're doing something wrong. You're doing something wrong, subhanAllah. So this is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Asr, we recite it all the time, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ Everybody is at loss. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ Except those who amen, who have faith, عَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Have done good, righteous deed. The last two criteria, وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ تَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ They advised each other of justice and haqq. We're not quiet, we're not weak. Because Islamically, you have to correct. Allah says in the Quran, أهليكم, even if it's against your own family. In the Quran, these are verses in the Quran. So when you start studying the Quran, and then in the Quran, you're like, oh, these are verses that no one has ever taught me. 
and Allah is speaking to us this way, subhanAllah, it's so empowering in a just way. Not in a way that makes you an angry feminist. I'm against that. I don't identify as a feminist. I don't think Muslim women should because it comes, it's a word that is loaded and comes with a lot of baggage and luggage and wrong. We don't need feminism when we have women rights in Islam. And when we're speaking about women, we have to speak about how we can reclaim our own rights from the deen. That's it. Islam came to liberate women. Islam came in a time pre-Arabia where they used to bury girls alive, where they used to be ashamed of girls. Islam came to change that. So we want to, you know, women were property back then, right? And Islam came to change that. Islam came to give us rights. So all, when we're speaking about this stuff, we're not saying anything outside of the deen. Anything in the deen, I want it. That's it. I want what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for me. Isn't that, is that too much to ask? Just like I want everything for a man, same as for him, his rights as well, and my rights, and the kids' rights, and the animal rights, and the earth's rights. We need to follow the Quran, not what some sort, you know, selective aspects about the Quran. So Khawla bint Thalaba was a woman who, Surat uh, al-Mujadila was revealed about her. She's a woman who her husband said a few not nice things to her. He said, yeah, yeah, because of children, I'm not gonna get into the details here. So as you all know the story, he basically wanted to distance himself from her. And he said, I'm going to treat you like my mother from now on. So you're married to me, but you're like my mother. So this was never mentioned before. Like this incident never happened. So she didn't sit there quietly and just feel sad for herself. And what an embarrassing story to go and to tell anyone about it. Some women do just sit and suffer for, in silence for a long time. She went to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says in the Quran, Tashtaki. She was actually complaining to the Rasul. And then she said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because the Rasul sallallahu, this is the interesting part of the story. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa himself could not help her. Because this has never happened in the ummah before. He doesn't know what the hukum for this is. So it's new. He's never heard of a man saying to his wife that you are like my mother. So he doesn't know how to treat and deal with the situation. So he said, I, I, there's no hukum in this. I don't know how to help you. I don't know what to do. Do I divorce you from him? Do I, uh, what do we do? He didn't know until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hukum came. And Allah, she gave a ruling till the end of times that has become from the Sharia. So she went after one, even she did not even get answers from the Rasul. So you can go to a Shaykh and he cannot help you. It's okay, he's a human. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could not give her answers. It's okay, don't blame the person. Go back to Allah, never be quiet though, never be, never compromise, never accept wrong. So she went to say, Ya Allah, I have no one but you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And she was a faithful woman. And Allah revealed Quran for her and gave her the solution. And unfortunately, nowadays, when women speak up about anything that is wrong, we are all, you know, often told off that you're a naga. You're, you know, you're not, like, if it's with haq, there's a difference. That's why I say learn. So you're doing it from knowledge. You're not doing it from your own desires and ego. That's a different story. You're not complaining about things that are stupid dunya-related matters. No, no, no. If there's a complaint, if you're arguing about something, you're arguing from the Quran and deen. You're saying to your husband, you cannot, like, you know, I had a sister the other day tell me her husband comes back home drunk every day, and they could see that. That's not acceptable in Islam. That's not something you have to be quiet about. Even this concept of obedience, we can talk about it at the end if, you, if, you, if we have time, inshallah. But there's no obedience to anybody who disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The obedience to husband in the Quran, in Islam, is conditional to a man's obedience to Allah. There's no blind obedience. There's no jump over the bridge, I'm going to listen to you. There isn't. That no one gets that except Allah and the Rasul. <laughs> no one gets that. You're not a slave. You don't become a person who's no agency, as we spoke about before, subhanAllah. So sisters, why, we need, why are we speaking about this? This is not to make us empowered in a secular Western way, to be empowered like the Sahabiyat. Because we want to become like them. We want to become like Khadija, like Aisha, a woman who spoke the haqq, who knew right from wrong, who had power, who had their own money, who, who had agency, who did their own ibadah, who had a say, who were, you know, like women, like they were abidat, they were productive, they were, you know, uh, efficient, they, were, they did good, they contributed to the revival of this ummah. Not weak, because their counterparts, the Rasul said, men and women are equal, counterparts to each other, and we each complement each other. It's not a competition, it's not a war. I don't like those gender wars that happen online, where everybody's just, you know, we're the better. No, there's no better. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum. The most pious of you have nothing to do with your gender, have nothing to do with your hair, have nothing to do with your eye color, nothing to do with your skin color, nothing, nothing, doesn't matter. Your language, your tongue, nothing. The most beloved to Allah are the ones with the most taqwa in their hearts. And no one can see taqwa except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can't even judge somebody's taqwa. You can say, I've got more taqwa than you. <laughs> like it doesn't work this way. Because taqwa is found in the heart. The place, the home for taqwa is the heart. It's not even a look thing. 
You can't say, oh, this person looks like they have more taqwa than me. Look at that. You can't. Taqwa is in the heart. Taqwa al-qulub. Nobody sees, I can't see anybody's heart. And even if I do, it's the physical heart is not the heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about. So we need to do, it is my responsibility and your responsibility as women, as revivers, as changers, as, as wise, as, mumma, as, as you are an army of this ummah. You are soldiers of Islam. Every single one of you has a purpose. Every single one of you Allah created to make change. Because you're all accountable, you're all responsible. Never think of yourself as I can't, I don't have the means, who am I? Allah created you and every person has a special gift. Everybody can do something, subhanAllah. Take your power back from the Quran, you know, so that you can be productive, so that you can be efficient, so that you can actually help this ummah revive again. Because it's not going to revive with women who are distant from the deen. It's only going to change and we're going to revive ourselves with women who are empowered in their Quran, in their deen, inshallah, so that we can make the difference. Because I'm not sure about you, but look at, uh, look at our motherlands. Look what's happening in our homelands. Zulum, oppression, injustices, dictators. We are supposed to be the leaders of the, of the world because we have a manual, the Quran, we have a catalog for life that works. It's guaranteed to work. It's guaranteed to give you success in this dunya and akhirah. So out of all people on earth, we should be the most content, we should be the happiest, we should be the most successful, the most advanced in technology, in education. We should be the exemplary to other humans. But how can we offer that, which we owe that to people, if we're not living it ourselves? If we, none of us has ever recited the Quran from cover to cover like that Jewish lady who did it in four months and she knew every single word. This is an American woman who doesn't speak Arabic. So what's the excuse? She got a tafsir book and she sat and she went word by word. She wrote word by word what each word means. And then she read the tafsir and she had notes and she finished it in four months. That was her full-time job. We, we are in need of that more than her. We should do that, inshallah. I'm just conscious of time, but I just would like to maybe open up for Q&A if anybody has any questions. We have like maybe five, ten minutes to do that, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you so much. Ahlan. Alhamdulillah. May Allah accept, Ya Rab. From all of us. First of all, are there any resources or books that we can go to to learn or start a reference back to the Quran? The Quran. Start with the Quran. I say always start with the Quran because it's, the, it's what the Rasul Sallallahu started with the Sahaba to change them. For the first 13 years in Mecca, the Rasul did not use any other sources but the Quran. It is enough. To learn about the women that you talked about. Yes, there actually isn't. There's actually lots of books on women, but it's not, um, like even I did a Khadija course uh, in, in Australia before I, like a few years ago. And it's really sad, sisters, like I, I get hot when I talk about this topic because I feel like we have, we have so much work to do. So when I wanted to do a course on Khadija, radiallahu anha, I did a six-week course, so I needed to do research, and I needed to get the books. It was really sad to say that there wasn't one book written on Khadija. Khadija, like, she lived with the Rasul for 25 years. She's the first Muslim. She's the one who supported it, him. She's the one who, some scholars say, without Khadija's wealth, you know the three years of boycott? Muslims would not have survived. She was from the Babu Sharif in Jannah. She's the one who gave him his children. She was a abid. We just focus on Khadija, the businesswoman. But there's like, that's just 1% about Khadija's personality. 99% people don't know, subhanAllah. But sadly, there isn't. So I even went to Mecca and Medina and asked about books about Khadija. And there was not even one book on Khadija. She was in a book of, uh, with other Sahabiyat. So you'd find the, the wafs of the Prophet. So she would be like a chapter, a few pages in a, in a book about the Muslim woman. But you would have Sahaba who were like not as significant as Khadija, volumes written on them. This is just for me. And I'm like, who do we blame? <laughs> no one but ourselves. I actually don't think, I think we need to, uh, you know, start writing. But you can't start writing before start, you know, learning. You need to learn. You need to encourage your daughters to go not into medicine and engineering because we are in lack of woman female scholarship. With the tafsir of the Quran, I study the tafsir of ulama, mufassirun, the exegesis of the Quran. It is, I, I was crying when I found out that from the time of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam till our times now, there's only been one woman who's done tafsir of the entire Quran. And she was just recent, in recent times. And it's in Arabic, not even in English. And we've got like thousands and thousands of male mufassirin. What is our excuse? Wallahi, I don't know. A hundred years ago, I would understand we had restrictions, like we could not travel as, as men did, we could not learn, we don't have, we have no access to knowledge online. Anybody can start their journey of knowledge online with a sheikh, with a sheikh, with a teacher. You start, there's books, you start with books, you start with the Quran. 
Number one, the Quran. The Sharia, you have to start with the Quran. And then if you don't know, so you have to assess, what am I with the Quran? Do I know how to recite it? If I don't, I'm going to get somebody to help me to recite. And then tafsir, and then tajweed, and then tadabbur. It's a journey. You have to, each one of you has to become a student of knowledge. Because we can't expect the next generations to change if we're not taking lead. And none of us has anything that most of, you might tell me, ah, oh, I don't know Arabic, I'm not Arab background. Most of the Mufassirun, the great scholars, are of non-Arabic backgrounds. They're not no, no, non-Arabs. Al-Qurtubi, Al-Suyuti, Zamakhshari, they were not Arabs. So there's no excuse. We've got access to translations now. We've got access to online. You can access any teacher in the world. You can create whatever you want. So after, I'll give an example of what I, because I felt like after that Jewish lady's uh, YouTube video, please Google her, she's interesting. Um, on YouTube, so I was like, oh my God, I've been in da'wah and I've never done tafsir of the entire Quran, but there isn't so, because you, you're going to come through obstacles. You're going to say, okay, I want to do this, but who's going to teach me? Who's going to, right? If you search and there's no one, you need to create it for yourself. You have to take initiative. Don't expect others to always provide for you what you need. This is a failure's mindset. The Sahaba, the Tabi'een, they always, you have to find a way. So what I thought, as I, in Sydney, I was like, I really want to study the Quran from cover to cover, but I don't want to do it on my, by myself, because I'm not a scholar in tafsir. I, might, I can read it, but I want to make sure, because tafsir, you can't do tafsir on your own. You have to have somebody teach you the tafsir. So I spoke to a sheikh that we had at the time, mashallah, his name was Sheikh Mu'tasim, Allah is khair. He was teaching tajweed, in, and he was, mashallah, he has a sharia degree. He does, he has, his tachassus, his specialization is in tafsir. And I asked him if he could do a course for us, and I would get a group of people, and we would pay him for the course to do the tafsir of the entire Quran from cover to cover to us. And he did. We did it over two and a half years, every Sunday for three hours. And we finished the Quran in two and a half years. We had 30 students. We started with like 100, but then they keep dropping, 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 <laughs> until we had like 30 at the end who were committed. Two and a half years. It didn't exist. This course didn't exist, but I needed it for myself. So if you want something for yourself, make it happen for you and others. Because you'll take hasanat in just creating it. I needed a halaqa for my girls, teenage halaqa in Sydney. There wasn't anything in my area. So I asked a friend who I thought I could trust with my kids close to their age. She's got some Islamic background. I said, okay, come, run a halaqa next to me because I don't want to drive an hour to somewhere. There were some halaqat, but not in my area for my girls. So it was five minutes away in the masjid. I spoke to the masjid. Can you guys give us the room on Friday night? Okay, of course, come. You need to take action. Like You can't just sit there and think... This sense of entitlement that we have as a Muslim community, and I work in the community, I know what it's like. It's sad. Like, we want something that, can you please, I had people tell me when I did the teenage uh, girls uh, halaqa, can you please do a boys one? I'm like, no, I don't have boys. <laughs> you do boys. You do your boys. I'm not going to go and search. Wallah, like, you do you and then invite other boys. Why should I worry about, make, you know, sourcing out a brother that teaches boys and then do the booking and then, we are entitled. You should not, we should all be, this is one ummah. An ummah is like a house, this building. You can't just have one person build this house. This room cannot be built by one person. You needed an architect, you needed an engineer, you need a painter, you need a plumber, you need a carpenter, you need a, right? You, we need everybody to be part of this ummah. And every person has something to contribute and offer, inshallah. So, two more questions. It's further. The next one is, do you do any courses online? I do, I do. Yes, I do. I have 80% of my work is for free. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Amin. I offer courses online. Um, you can follow me on my Instagram page, Dalia Ayyub. And I share almost everything, like if I'm doing anything, anything there, inshallah. Um, and so we, I do focus all the Qur'ans that I do, Tadabur courses, I do, which is something I'm, I'm a huge advocate for, to recite the Qur'an with reflection. So that you're finding your story in the Qur'an. And when you start reciting this way, you never get enough. Subhanallah. Something again that we need to do. So yes, anything is inshallah on my, you, you can follow me on Instagram inshallah for more details. Inshallah. And the last question is you spoke about, uh, there's so many things I want to ask you. So I'm just going to pick out the one you spoke about, um, like, Zulul is done against us, so this physical abuse. Yes. Abuse. Or emotional abuse. Because this lady, Khawla bint Thalaba, it wasn't physical, it was emotional abuse. And she still wasn't quiet about it. Yeah, it doesn't matter who he is. Mm -mm. So often, like, in the community, it's not family. Yes. People who live with your parents, your siblings. Yes, so. because none of us were taught about healthy boundaries, because none of us were following the Quran and Sunnah, because we think even hatta, usually abuse comes from parents in our cultures, as if parents are like gods that, you know, if you say no or you don't accept their wrong, you're, you're, doing, you're not being a dutiful child. So that's not in Islam. In Islam, if you, that's why sisters, when you start learning the deen, you'll be like, whoa, like 
There's evidence in the Quran and Sunnah that says you don't just follow, you don't just accept everything wrong, subhanAllah. Even your parents, they can't take, some people like have to give their money or their money to their parents. Islamically, Islamically, we did, uh, I, I have a halaqa online. We were talking about zakah and sadaqa last week, uh, two, last week in halaqa. In Islam, if your parents have a roof, if they've got money, like income, they've got their basic needs met, you should not give them money. Because your money is not even your money. So there will be extra. If you're giving more money for your mom to buy jewelry and you know bangles and gold, you can gift her. You can. You take hasanat gifting her, but it's not compulsory on you. Because if you have extra money, there's somebody who doesn't have bread somewhere else in the world, and that money is better going that place. So Islam is not just give, give, no boundaries. The Quran, you know, are, you know boundaries. We have not ever been taught boundaries from Islam. The Quran is full of boundaries, full of boundaries, full like, you know, when you, that's why it says start with the Quran, start reading the Quran, start learning from the Quran. You don't need a middle person. Subhanallah. Like in the Quran, I'll give you an example of a boundary that none of us were taught. In the Quran, if you're, it says in the Quran that um, uh, about the knocking and in the hadith as well, the Rasul said that if somebody knocks at your door, Okay, I just want you to imagine this. Because if we do it, if anyone does it, <laughs> it will be like, you know. So uh, uh, if somebody knocks at your door and, you know, there are guests coming to visit you, but you're not ready to have them. Sometimes we've been through that. You probably have your period, you're tired, your body aches, you came back from work, you've just had a fight with your husband. Life, sah? You're just not ready to receive these guests who just came unannounced. They knocked at your door. Islamically, you have the right to open the door and say, I'm not ready to have you as a guest today. Can you please return? And Islamically, they have to return and not be upset. Now, imagine. Because <laughs> I was telling imagine. If any of us does, that's for deen. deen. We're talking about deen. You know, honestly, if I was to do that, everybody in Palestine will know about it. For a starter. Like all my family's family, neighbors will know that you've turned away a guest. So, and will be shamed and will be, why? Because we are not teaching the deen. We did not grow up with the deen. We grew up with culture. But when you start teaching your kids the deen, if you teach your kids that, if they were to do that in 20, 30 years time, it's, not gonna, it's gonna be norm. Because it's a deen. But now it's like weird. Don't do that now, because of course it's weird. No one knows that. Don't go try something, you know what I mean? Something, you have to be wise, because you don't wanna break family ties. You can't just shut the door at somebody's face visiting you. You know, but Islamically, you are supposed to do that. Because Islam is about authenticity. It's about being real. I don't want somebody to come in when I'm exhausted and I don't want to have them there. I'm being a hypocrite when I'm actually serving them coffee. Like, eh, but I'm not here. Like, I'm not. From inside, I'm like, I don't want you to be here. Right? This is not authenticity. This is not, this is lying. I'm pretending to be happy that you're here, but I'm not happy that you're here. Islam is about being authentic, being real, being honest, being trusted. So we kind of kill those attributes because we're so concerned about pleasing others. And making sure that, you know, it's aib, it's shame. All of us grow, grew up with shame, 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 shame. It's aib, it's aib, it's aib. But there's no aib in Islam. There's haram and there's halal. There's no shame. The, the concept of shame, we call it aib in Arabic. Aib, don't do that because it's aib. What's aib? <laughs> Where does that fit in with haram and halal? Is it halal? If it's halal, then I'm going to do it. If it's haram, I'm not going to do it. Don't tell me, that, you know, aib is about people. And hype changes according to time and cultures and, and expectations, inshallah. Anyone else? Any questions, sisters? Yes. Wa alaikum as-salam wa rahmatullah. So I have three children, two children. Mashallah. And my day consists of obviously I'm homeschooling my children because of the LGBT. And then I'm also working as a teacher. Yes. And it's just... That's okay, don't be... Yeah, because can I tell you why you feel this quickly? Because I felt exactly like you, and I used to, I know exactly how you feel, because we don't think the raising of our children is ibadah. We just think, no, 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 ibadah. When we think about, remember how I said at the beginning, when we think about the ideal Muslim woman, you have an image. She's on the maybe the prayer mat. <laughs> she's got, a, you know, she's praying, she's reading Quran all the time. This is holding your son right now is ibadah, and you're taking hasanat as you go, subhanAllah. So it's about our own expectations of, of you know, ourselves. That's very, very important. The other thing I want you to, I'm going to sit down. No, I'll sit down. I'll go back sitting down. The other thing, subhanAllah, that's so important for you in this time, and I tell this to all sisters, you need to, and listen to this carefully, sisters, you need to honor each phase that you are living. How do I honor each phase? When I had, I had two kids under two, and I was living in rural Victoria in Australia, no Muslim. There was like, I was the only one in, in town, the Muslim person in town. And I had two kids under two years old. 
this is a phase in my life that I had to live. If I wanted to be around community, around halaqat, around classes, it wouldn't have happened. So I would have put pressure on myself, subhanAllah. Why? Why should I put that pressure on myself? This is the time in my life. My kids have grown, so you need to honor that phase. That phase is like, kids, I even tell sisters when they have babies, don't even do goal setting. Who has time? You, don't, you can't do even do, do goals. Because goal setting is about having, you can have you know, general goals, but goal setting is about having your own time and having ownership over your time. When you have a baby, you, don't, you only sleep when the baby sleeps. And when they wake up, you, have, you can't even say, I'm going to do this from 9 to 10. Because what if they're up from 9 to 10? You know, even if it's their nap time, they might change their, time, <laughs> their mind and not have nap time. So subhanAllah, when the kids are young, from 0 to 5, this is nurturing time. This is you just trying to do the basics. The basics is farad, fard. I'm not going to miss my salah, even if I'm not concentrated as much as I'd like to, but I'm just doing the fard, the basics. So I'm not going below the line. When the kids go to school, now my kids, all my girls, the three girls, they go to school, university. So from 8 in the morning till 4 p.m., I have no one in the house. What I can do now is different from what I could do when they were two under two in the house. Does that make sense? So this is a phase in my life, and this is a phase in my life. For me to want to do this here and this here, I'm going to add more guilt on myself and feel bad for no reason. And Allah does not want that for us, subhanAllah. So take it easy on yourself. You're doing amazing by just trying, by just connect to Allah, doing dhikr as much as you can. It's the greatest act of worship, subhanAllah. And praying, best. do the fard, do the basics. When they are older, inshallah, you can have time for more other things, but you are actually gaining hasanat and taking rewards with every minute you're going around your children, inshallah. Yes, sister, the back. Sorry, I can't hear you, sister, very well. Yes, yes. Yes. I'm not sure, Wallahi, I don't know. No, no, I just want to rectify from like, the audience that I'm not understanding. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, that's all right. Yes, yes. Jazakallahu <laughs> khairan for clarifying. Thank you. Yes. Yes, it is. It's so powerful, but we're not, we're not close to the Quran. So the Quran, you know, ha, you ha, sisters, if there's one thing I want you to leave with today from everything you listened, renew your relationship with the Quran. Just measure, measure where am I at? As I mentioned at the beginning, if the Quran is here and I'm here, I need to feel like I need to get closer to the Quran. So everybody's journey with the Quran is different. Some people need to start reciting. Some people need to start. And everything about the Quran, you can do so many things. You can listen to the Quran. We listen to the Quran when like, we're talking, we're driving. When was the last time you actually sat down on your bed or a couch, quiet room, you put the Quran to play and you just closed your eyes and you listened, even if you did not understand. There's a certain healing power to just listening to the Quran. There's different healing from reciting it, from tadabbur, from tafsir, from hibs. Each, you know, each thing gives you a different, subhanAllah, connection to the Quran. And the best way, the best way to connect to the Quran, you know how, sisters? Is to act by the Quran. So somebody can know only قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ الْمُعَوِّذَاتِ And they pray with that. But their akhlaq and their manners are in line with the akhlaq of the Qur'an. This person is better in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their minimal Qur'an than somebody who has memorized the entire Qur'an and they're abusers. Or they, and and you know, I spoke about this subhanAllah in a story today. I had one sister yesterday at the um, event tell me, uh, we, I spoke yesterday uh, at the cafe about seven, uh, uh, seven ways to connect to the Qur'an. So the sister at the end, there's a sister that came and she said, Jazakallah khair, that was really nice and everything. But can you please talk about how sometimes even reciting the Quran can make you worse of a person? And I'm like, how? She's like, you know, one of my parents, she finds her significance and, and it's like a mask to show people that I am religious. And the more she recites Quran, the worse she becomes. <laughs> She's like, I am a hafiz, I'm this, I'm that. So this is actually called spiritual abuse. And narcissists sometimes, we have religious narcissists who gain their power from, they gain their significance, it gives them that supply that they are Qur'an hafiz, or they've got a, you know, they've got a uh, prestigious, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, position in their organization, or that they so they, it feeds their ego. The Qur'an is not meant to feed our egos. The Qur'an is not meant to feed our egos. The Qur'an is meant to feed our souls. And if a person is truly connected to the Qur'an, they'll be the kindest person, they'll be the nicest person, they'll be so good with other people, 
If somebody is reciting Quran and they're hafiz and whatever, and they're bad, they treat you bad, they're not people of the Quran. The people of the Quran are the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the best of people. You want to be in their company. You feel good about yourself when you're around them. You don't feel judged. You don't feel shamed. You don't, they don't make you feel like they're here and they're there. If somebody makes you feel this way, they might have all the degrees, all the Quran knowledge. They don't know the Quran. You can, know, you can have a Bedouin person who knows maybe a few ayat, but they have such good manners and hearts and good character. This person in the sight of Allah is a million times better than that person who's arrogant. And, um, and by the way, there's actually a hadith in the Quran, and I told this hadith to the sister yesterday. Amongst the first people that the hellfire will be lit upon, this is a hadith sahih, are hafiz of the Quran. Have you ever heard that before? And the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, how? The, amongst the first people that the fire would be lit, Jahannam will be opened, lit, is through Hafiz of the Quran. How? They said he, they memorized it for people to say that they have memorized. For eager, not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. They didn't do it. Because if they've done it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake, you will see it through their actions. You will see it through the way they treat you. You will see it through the way they, believe, they, they make you feel about yourself and how they deal with humans around them, subhanAllah. So this is very, very crucial that, and um, you know, as parents as well, if you are reciting Quran, if you're connecting to the Quran, don't let the kids see your bad behavior with the Quran. Like this is something I do now, yani, subhanAllah. So when I'm reciting Quran, and you know, so I'm reciting my word today, and then I want to yell at one of my kids. Yani, I'm a mom, I yell yani, as well. I'm not, yeah. <laughs> so I want to, like somebody hasn't done their chore, somebody is late, somebody needs to come and do the dishes. So I make sure that if I see them, that I actually put the Quran down, and then I yell at them. Because I don't want them to associate me, the Quran, with my bad behavior. And I'm not saying it's right, yani, to yell at the kids. Yani, I love my kids. My name is like, enough, too much information. But well, I, you know, subhanAllah, because it's so bad to recover from this trouble. You know, I have sisters who told me, I have many sisters who told me that one sister told me I can't even look at the Mus'haf. I can't even look at the Quran. Why? She said, because my dad was so abusive to me and my mother and my sisters, and he was a hafiz and he was always reciting Quran. So when I look at the Quran, I remember him. How can you unlearn that? She's an adult person now. She, she struggles to open the Mus'haf. And I'm like, don't let him win twice. <laughs> don't let him do, you know, like, don't. You know, that's, the Quran has nothing to do with his behavior. The Quran should have made him the best father to you, the most merciful to you. And that's his own traumas that you saw. It wasn't the Quran, but she saw him always holding the Quran. So don't, even when you're reciting the Quran, you want to have, put the Quran down. Don't let your kids see you holding the Quran. Because they're going to associate Quran with your bad behavior. Little things like that, sisters. Never become, the more religious you become, the better person you should become. The more lovable you should become. The best of you are the best to your families. You can't be best to people outside. I am not who I am now to you because you just met me. I can say nice things. I can show you that, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm good. But you don't know me. Who knows me are my family at home, my husband and my kids. And that goes both ways for husbands and for wives. So if everybody's saying some amazing things about a man outside, I don't care about what people say about a man outside or a woman outside. I care about what their family say about them because what their family say about them is the truth. Simple as that. And it's not, I'm not bringing this up from me. Again, I don't share anything from my own nafs. I'm sharing it with evidence. The Rasul said in a hadith sahih, khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli. The best amongst you are the best to your family. وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِي And I'm the best to my family. So I can say that somebody's measure, a man's measure or a woman's measure is in accordance to what their family think of them? Yes. So if I want to know how good a man is, I, I go ask his wife, how is he at home? I don't care about what the community thinks. <laughs> Honestly, I don't. That's the, 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 uh, the Rasul gave us the measure. The measure is not the, you know, what you're wearing on the outside, what you do, how much money you give in charity. That's not the measure. It's not the measure. The measure is who are you to your wife? Who are you to your husband? Who are you to your children? SubhanAllah. And if we have healthy, healed homes that practice the faith and the deen, we won't have any of our issues, inshallah. Take one more question, inshallah. One more question. Yes? Yeah. I mean, uh, you've grown up, in, you've lived in Australia, we're living in the UK. And one of the elements I find really difficult to struggle with is, as we grow up, there's mm. a sense of godliness in society, there's a sense mm. of belief in God, whether you're a Christian or yeah. whatever background you come from. But now you can see it's a complete lack within schools, ah. within... It's within scary America. now. Yeah. yeah. It but is it's absolutely scary. Yeah, there's a lack of mention of God, even in schools. Yes. It, the, the, like even one of the reasons I left Australia is because of that. I never thought I'd leave because I had my committee, I had my da'wah, I had like I was really doing well, alhamdulillah, in many areas. But towards the last three to five years, we've changed, we've seen change in policies where I could I could not raise like I can raise my kids, alhamdulillah, and they're good, alhamdulillah, may Allah protect them and keep them steadfast. But I'm not sure if their kids' kids would be the same. 
So when in my grave, I was like, I want to make a decision with my husband that Allahu Alam. I'm not I'm an advocate for hijrah. <laughs> right. <coughs> as, as you're bottom line in terms of living in the West or now not ten years ago, now, now yes. Yeah, now, because we're not talking about, we're talking about policies. We're yes. talking about governments. Yeah. We're not, you know, and it's going to touch each house. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm active in da'wah in, in Sydney. I have not, there isn't a single Muslim home in Australia that has not been impacted by either secularism yeah. or atheism or gays and lesbian. There isn't. There, like, there isn't. And, you know, research even shows, like, Dr. Sheikh Yasser Qadi, <coughs> most of you know Yasser Qadi, he came to Sydney 10 years ago, and I remember him saying that, because the Muslim community in, in Australia and UK are quite, they're still babies. Like, you're, most of you here are second generation. So you're born here, but your parents are not born here. Most of you, like us in Australia. In the US, they're much older than us. So they've got fourth and fifth generation Muslims. Sheikh Yasser Qadi came 10 years ago to Sydney. 10 years ago, not now, like not now. And he said he's done research. It was research-based, that was 10 years ago, that 30% of Muslims in the U.S. have left Islam. 30% 10 years ago. I don't know, subhanAllah, for me, these are scary statistics, and I know it got worse by now, because he was actually even saying in the lecture, we don't know with the 70% how Muslim are they anyway. They might be Muslim by name. So the actual fact, like us here with hijab, you come to halaqat, we're like 10 to 20% of Muslims. We're not the, we're not the majority. So, and again, yani Allah, may Allah protect us. I don't want to freak you out. I just not to <laughs> do fear mongering, because I know, I just, I just feel like it's a manner to share, like this is my experience, but I also know that it's, it's a privilege to be able to move, because some people cannot afford it financially, some people are refugees, some, I have friends who have special needs kids that they can't go to anywhere else because they need the luxuries of the West. So everybody's circumstances are different. As long as you have the niya in your heart, I think it's important to have the hijraniya. Hijra is only compulsory when there's a clear Muslim state, but there isn't yet. That's why it's still like in limbo. But if there was like a clear state where like they're practicing the Sharia, it becomes compulsory in every single one of us to go to that country. And if we die in non-Muslim lands, we go to Jahannam. This was what happened. When, when Hijra became compulsory during the Prophet ﷺ's time from Mecca to Medina, People who died, Muslims who died in Mecca, Allah, the malaika took them to their hand because they said, why didn't you leave? Why were you okay being persecuted? They said, oh, we, were, we were weak. Kunna and the malaika tell them, Alam takun ardullahi wasi. wasn't Allah's earth vast for you to travel? So they had excuses. But only that time, we can't say now this is the case. <laughs> Definitely not because there's no clear Dar al-Iman, Dar al-Kufr, like that's another. I have a Hijra talk on my Instagram page. You guys can watch that. It's, it, I talk about all these things in details, inshallah. But you can create, I believe that even if in any circumstance, try to be with the Muslim community. Try to attend events, even in the West. You can. You can raise your kids in a good way, inshallah. So yani, it, we are living in difficult times. We are living at the end of times. In times, the Rasulullah said that the person who's holding on to their faith, it's like they're holding on to hope. Cold. And it feels like that. Wearing hijab is hard. Saying the truth is hard. Saying this is haram is saying this is a woman, not a man. Is <laughs> you, you know everything is changing. Subhanallah. So it is hard. So I'm not going to romanticize it or make it easier. What makes it easier? The Rasul said. They, 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 he, they, he said to Sahaba, at the end of the times, you'll be, your faith will be holding on like hot coal. What do we do, Ya Rasulullah? The Sahaba said, what is the solution? He said, Alaykum bil Qur'ani wa sunnati. Hold on firmly to the Qur'an and my sunnah. That's the only way you'll be saved. How you do that in your own way, do that in the best way that you can, inshallah. One more question, inshallah. Yes. Yes. Huge topic. Maryam Sawri, Dora. Khudi Surah. How do you? How do you help somebody be not become a narcissist? You don't. How to stop being a narcissist? Narcissists don't stop being. Uh, look, uh, can I just? This is again uh, an hour's worth. But uh, narcissist, you run the other way. Like you know, that, that's my experience, and that this is uh, you know I, I speak from a you know, counseling perspective. There's no, you can't change a narcissist because they don't think they've done anything wrong. They think it's always your fault. So there's, you don't change a narcissist. And a narcissist himself, they can't change because they're not even aware that they're doing anything wrong. I don't know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with narcissists. It's the only personality disorder that I don't know how they're going to be judged because are they sick? Are they like aware? Do they have the awareness or do they not have the awareness? We don't know. So we just protect ourselves from them as much as we can. And sometimes we'll be tested by them through parents, through spouses. With parents, you kind of stuck. You just have to create boundaries. With a spouse, you have the option to stay or leave Islamically. Um, but what's important, very important sisters to know, and this is what psychologists say about narcissists, no one is born as a narcissist. They are made. 
and they're usually made from the age of five to ten years. So they've seen either a narcissistic parent or they, um, they were raised in a way where like, there's lots of attention on them, there's trauma, there's, um, they're being, they're, their ego's being fed. So just make sure that you raise your children in a way, as we mentioned, on the Quran and Sunnah. So parents have a huge part. Tafadda, your sister. Yeah. Just to say, because I was having to go back to what you said about um, getting more women, like we don't need any more people, like young people going into medicine and law and finance. And we need sharia, we need, need scholars. Right? Yes. But if we look at, um, I was having this conversation with one of my other um, learned teachers, and I was saying, like, I don't have um, children, so I say to people who have got, like, children, Look at, if you look at um, the generation that we are, the next generation, uh, just our mother tongue language, mm. we're losing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we look at Islam, mm. like we're also losing that as well. And it's to look at, you know, putting our children, getting them to become mm. like learned, yes. become scholars, and they can go and create those pockets of spaces mm. and, and continue mm. the knowledge of Islam. Yes. And I think it's really important if we don't come together. As a community, as a hundred percent, a hundred percent, yes, and and it's different. We need female scholars, you need sisters to teach sisters because it's different. Hala, I benefit from male brothers, may Allah reward them and shiyukh, but it's different when I'm learning from a female, very different. I can take some things from here, I can't take from here. So, it's so important that you start with yourselves as well. Like if I want my daughter to become a scholar, I have to become a scholar. If I want her to memorize Quran, I need to start memorizing Quran. Like we usually expect our family to do it, but we need to be the ones who are leading that. And I think none of us have an excuse. No matter what age you are, no matter how, you know, you need to start create. My advice would be create a halaqa, even in your home. Once a week, once a fortnight. You don't have to be a sheikh, you don't have to be a scholar. I started my halaqat when I was 23. And I was given by a sister, she's like, oh, I run a halaqa. I'm like, I don't know anything in Islam to run a halaqa. Like, I, I pray, I fast, but that's about it. She said, I'm not asking you to come up with the knowledge. <laughs> I'm going to give you, you take a book and you just read the knowledge <laughs> and just share it. That's wallahi how I started. It was in a masjid for 16 year olds. She said, just go every fortnight. We just need some Friday night for the girls to come somewhere, the teenagers. And every week, just prepare, read the notes before. So you're sharing from the book. You're not creating the knowledge. And that's it. This is called da'wah. This is not, we're not claiming to be scholars. You just, you know, you're there. You're preaching to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and just be in that gathering. So every person here in this room, they can do this. And you should, you should do this. I think, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the most transformative things in my own life was halaqat. Yes, I've done the university degrees and I'm doing my PhD now. That is knowledge, but it's not like the knowledge you get in halaqat. That's just like academic knowledge. You have to hand in assignments and you have, you learn, but I did not learn Islamic knowledge from the university degrees. I learned from the halaqat, from my own readings, from listening to lectures. How easy is it that we have access to knowledge now? We have technology, but we're not utilizing it in a powerful way. You can have a scholar invite them to your house every single day by a click of a button. You can listen to anybody. Back in the days, they used to go on a camel for three, six months to go get one hadith. <laughs> That's the, their life had to be put on hold for them to learn the deen. Now we, can ha we have access of that. No, we, we don't have an excuse, whatever you are, whatever your lifestyle is. You can listen to lectures and you can learn. And you start with, you, where do I start with my uh, knowledge? Start listening to a lot of muhadarat from good scholars. And then you start building your own foundation because you hear things over and over again and you start having like a credit in knowledge. Like you've heard this a few times. So you know, yeah, yeah, this is how you, you've heard about salah, you've heard about tahara, you heard about zakah, you know about tazkiyat uh, al-nafs, the disease of the heart. Listen to lectures every single day, every single day. I listen to a lecture every single day for the past 20 years. And in the first year that I was living in a rural, a rural Victoria with my girls when they were two under two, I listened to five to six lectures a day because I had nothing else. And I just thought my husband got this satellite dish. It was like the thing and it had Arabic TV. <laughs> and one of the channels was like, I remember Qanat al-Nas and Qanat al-Majid from Egypt and from Saudi. And I would just put, it was just lectures all day long. We didn't have WhatsApp, we didn't have phones, none of that. 18 years ago, so I would put play the lectures and I'd be running around the sister who's saying about the kids I'll be just running around the kids cooking cleaning. I'd have it on loud and Even if I don't catch the entire lecture if I even listen to 10% that's enough Imagine listening to that over a year five to six lectures a day Like I knew what the scholars said about certain matters I would even know how to answer like I didn't but yeah because I've heard the answers if somebody asks about woman travel I've heard what the fatwa on woman travel is by herself 
Like I would know just from listening. So start with listening. No, no so number one, start with the Quran. Number two, start with halaqat. Run a halaqa or attend a halaqa on a weekly basis or fortnightly. Number three, listen up to a lot of lectures. Number four, make dua for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you to, to beneficial knowledge. And just, yeah, read books, be open, connect with people of knowledge that expand you. Subhanallah. And you'll find your people because you're only going to attract who you are, not what you want. If I want to be, like, and you're, you're, there's actually also a, a, a thing, a saying that you are, you're going to become, you're the average of the five, this is called the proximity of five. This is a psychology, a scientifically proven. You're the average of the five that you spend the most time with in terms of their finances, in terms of their knowledge, in terms of their deen. You're the average of the five. So let's say the five closest to you in your circle are multimillionaires. You cannot be not a multimillionaire. Like, you have to be the average of them, financially even. If the, av if the five that you hang out with the most are scholars and shuyukh and huffad, you can't be somebody who doesn't know how to recite the Quran. Like, they won't hang out with you. Does that make sense? Like, everybody's gonna, you're gonna attract your circle. Like, you know, you're gonna be the average in terms of even manners, the, in terms of your, you know, social background, in terms of what you do in a week. What you do in a week, you're the average of the people that you're, you're, you hang out with the most. They do similar to you, things. Because we, it's like that, subhanAllah. So how do we change our proximity of five? We become what we want, and then we start, subhanAllah, you start being in those circles. A person who's a hafiz of Quran, they're not gonna go hang out with people who go clubbing. They just won't. It's, they're not their people. They're gonna attract people who are in that sphere, subhanAllah. May Allah guide us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Also then leave you away from, that say for example, your family don't have those traits. Yeah, 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 you don't have to say. No, no, no. Sisters. Uh, with families, most of us are not going to be more in the, you know, families like uh, the Sahaba. <laughs> most of us. And does it mean you, you don't go to your family and say, look, you're not from the ideal proximity of five. We need to disconnect. You don't do that. <laughs> you know, the Rasul himself, he had non-Muslim family members, his own uncles. You know, it's about finding alternatives. The Rasul circle wasn't even from his family mainly. It was from just the Sahaba. Abu Bakr wasn't related to him. Umar al-Khattab wasn't related to him. You create your own circle with that saying bye to the other family. Family is family. You have to have patience with family and we'll be tested the most with family. Every single person here, their biggest test is with their family. Every, without, without knowing your stories. I can, you know, halal bit on that. So I don't know how you do a halal bit. But anyway, <laughs> you know, wallahi, every person will be tested in a relationship with their family. It's the hardest test. And most of us are tested with that test, whether it's a parent, spouse, children, uncle, auntie, you know. So for you to be able to live like Hada, you need to start creating circles that through halaqat like-minded sisters who come together for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. You come together because you want to be productive. You want to be women who are readers. You want to create a book club, discuss a book once a month over coffee. Just think about the possibilities. And it's not easy. I started with my halaqa that my teacher, when I was in Melbourne, that was like, Maryam, when Maryam was only like one. She's 18, mashallah now. So that was 18 years ago. That was my first halaqa. I, didn't knew, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. I actually wore hijab just two years before in university, so I wasn't even practicing. So, and I always, the more you know, the more you feel like you don't know, but you have to start somewhere. You start somewhere, subhanAllah. And I tell you, sisters, halaqat is the way to go. There's the best way of knowledge. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I run a virtual halaqa online. Um, I used to have 100 students in Sydney. I, we have had, we've had the same students for a long time, mashallah. But I selected those sisters so that they can run their own halaqat. And alhamdulillah, by the time I left, we, had, we have now 80 halaqas separate halaqas being run from this, these sisters. And each sister has at least 20 students. And they check back with me and I check with my teachers and you know, we're all students of knowledge. We have a hundred of study circles from the one study circle. <laughs> Can you see that like doable? And you don't have to be a sheikh or a scholar because we, we talk about the books, I share with them the resources, the scholarly books and you just read. And, if they and I tell them, if you have somebody asks you a question and you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know the answer. And I will tell you, I don't know the answer. If I didn't know, don't make it up. <laughs> I go ask somebody who knows and I come back to you. It's not haram to do that. But that would be like 5% of the questions. Most questions you would get to know, inshallah, through knowledge and learning yourself as well. Barakallah fikum. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah wa lakum. Jazakumullahu khair for being amazing. Listeners, on a Saturday, uh, inshallah, afternoon, may Allah make this gathering in our mizan of good deeds, ya Rabbil Alameen. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all beneficial knowledge. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the people of the Quran. 
Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us the best of women on this earth, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to return us to our deen, to give, us, uh, to give our hearts healing, to seal our hearts, to grant us the guidance, the nur, the huda of the Qur'an and its teachings so that we can live by the Qur'an and so that we can impact our societies and circles and families and ummah at large, Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah bless and protect every single one of you. Jazakumullah khairan for the very uh, kind and generous hosting. May Allah bless you all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.